The history line should evince an opposite trend, climbing from its 1829 low point as items are confirmed with increasing scholarship. Because of their clear differences, an evaluation of trends in scholarship ought to reveal which hypothesis better explains the data. A major turning point in Book of Mormon studies came with the realization that early Mormons, including the Prophet Joseph Smith himself, had misunderstood salient facts of geography, history, and culture embedded in the narrative. This insight has shifted the whole debate in recent years. The book describes a small place. An argument against the idea that Book of Mormon lands encompassed all of North and South America was provided by Joseph Smith. In 1842, he received a copy of the recent bestseller by John Lloyd Stevens, Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, the first popular English book to describe and illustrate Maya runes. This book amazed the English-speaking world with evidence of an advanced civilization that no one imagined existed, no one, that is, except Mormons. The prophet was thrilled, and excerpts from the book were reprinted in the Times and Seasons with his unsigned commentary. Quote, since our extract from Stevenson's book was published, we have found another important fact relating to the truth of the Book of Mormon. Central America is situated north of the Isthmus of Darien and once embraced several hundred miles of territory from north to south. The city of Zarahemla stood upon this land. It will not be a bad plan to compare Mr. Stevenson's ruined cities with those of the Book of Mormon. As evident in his comments, Joseph Smith believed Maya, Maya archaeology vindicated the Book of Mormon. His placement of Zarahemla in eastern Guatemala implied that the land southward described in the Book of Mormon was north of Darien, as Panama was then called. Thus, his commentary presupposed a smallest geography that excluded South America. This Book of Mormon geography contradicts what Joseph at first believed about the book, and if it's a corner of the Americas, he did not know. Therefore, he could not have derived the book's geography from his personal experience, nor have made it up. It necessarily follows that he dictated a book with, a, with complexities beyond his own comprehension. New evidence from archaeology reveals other complexities in the book that we will, dis we will discuss today. To set the stage for our arguments, let's consider the following popular evangelical claims. Quote, the Bible is supported in its truth claims by the corroborating evidence of geography and archaeology. That assertion cannot be said of the Book of Mormon. Several decades of archaeological research funded by LDS institutions concerning, concentrating in Central America and Mexico have yielded nothing that corroborates the historic details described in the Book of Mormon. I have worked for the LDS institution mentioned in this quote, the New World Archaeological Foundation, for the past 28 years, so I know somewhat concerning this matter. Everything about this argument is wrong. Its claims are false and its logic second rate. Archaeology and geography support the Book of Mormon to the same degree and for the same reasons that they support the Bible. Both books present the same challenges for empirical confirmation and both are in good shape. Many things have been verified for each, but many have not. Critical arguments specialize in listing things mentioned in the Book of Mormon that archaeology has not found. You are all familiar with this list. This list enjoys a particularly exalted status in critical circles because it, is, it was created by Thomas Stuart Ferguson, a trial lawyer who spent most of his adult life promoting Book of Mormon archaeology. He was the key player in organizing the New World Archaeological Foundation in 1952 and the Department of Archaeology at BYU in 1946. He wrote several books defending the Book of Mormon, but he eventually lost his faith and died a disbeliever, a point documented beyond reasonable doubt. Presumably, part of the reason for Ferguson's loss of faith was the poor, the poor performance of the Book of Mormon in the face of physical evidence. Critics would have us believe that because of his vast knowledge of Mesoamerican archaeology, and his intellectual integrity, Ferguson's apostasy counts more than that of others and should be persuasive to us. We find no greater merit in his disbelief than the incredulity of millions of others. 
Ferguson was trapped in his own iron illogic and facile thinking that proof of the book of the book was possible in the first place. Many other saints and critics are in, ensnared in the same trap. The only thing keeping them there is bad logic and perhaps pride. In none of the pro and con literature with which we are familiar is a competent argument made about what would constitute verification of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. All that we have found are rules of thumb for rejecting the book, sometimes with the slimmest pretext. What percentage of items mentioned in the text must be confirmed before one should accord it credence? Some authors claim that the inability of modern archaeology to verify the presence of horses, steel, silk, and other items in the New World is sufficient cause for rejecting the book. We will be the first to acknowledge that the Book of Mormon has problems with physical evidence that challenges belief, especially the missing metals, plants, and animals. When some church members see the list we are advertising here, they despair, perhaps because they don't know how archaeology works, or better yet, how archaeology doesn't work. Ferguson's list and all others like it are actually good news. As a tally of major deficiencies, this is a very short list indeed, especially for a book which makes several thousand claims about an ancient American past. It is instructive to remember the biblical archaeologists are still looking for evidence of Abraham and Moses after two centuries of searching. So what is a few misplaced grains, metals, and animals among friends? All of the children of Israel who followed Moses out of Egypt are still missing and unaccounted for archaeologically, but their descendants are our friends and neighbors. My message here is that archaeology is among the crudest of methods for establishing facts and truth, so one should not get overheated about what has or has not been found at any given hour. By focusing only on missing evidence, one loses perspective. We all know what is missing. A question we should ask more often, what has been found? Before we review some of the recovered items, please remember that if the book were a hoax, there should not be any evidence to support it, not even one bottle cap, hairpin, or cigarette butt. Because of the logic of evidence in this instance, one positive correspondence counts for dozens of missing ones. For example, one documented steel sword trumps several herds of missing horses and elephants. The hypothesis of human authorship of the Book of Mormon demands that truth claims in the book be judged by what was believed, known, or knowable in Joseph's backyard in the 1820s. The book's description of ancient peoples differs greatly from the racist notions of rude savages as held by 19th century Americans. The book's claims of city societies was laughable at the time, but no one is laughing them now. Early saints thought the discovery of cities vindicated the text. Scholars have since learned that many of the cities that captured Mormon imagination do not date to the right time period, but others do. The techniques for dating these places only became generally available in the 1960s. To find real rather than imagined correspondences, we have to be in the right place and time. In our analysis, we follow Joseph Smith in thinking that Book of Mormon lands were located in Central America, so that's where we will look for physical evidence. The first archaeological claims related to the Book of Mormon concern the facts of September 22, 1827. 